Lopez. I'm a uh, LATC scholar in residence along with Chantal Rodriguez and Dr. Jorge Huerta. And uh, I'm also a member of the steering committee and as a, a, a scholar here in the Los Angeles area, have been uh, helping to have several conversations in various theaters and among theater artists and talking about issues of violence and trauma. And so this conversation is adding to that to really think about the specific work that we're doing here at the Cuento. If you go into all of the plays, um, going to the Tertullias, and uh, really thinking about if we we're going to boil it down to you know, what is a common theme that threads throughout the work that we're seeing on stage at the Encuentro, violence is certainly one of the predominant themes that we see uh, thread through. Um, what a, uh, so I'm really excited that we have the opportunity to talk about that theme, talk about the way uh, that these theater artists are uh, engaging with that theme as a very central part of the work that they create and doing it in a very deliberate and conscious manner, as well as just seeing it as part of the artistic work that they do. And, um, and to talk with you, because I think all of us, we live in a culture that is very steeped in violence. We come from his colonialist histories of violence. A lot of us are personal survival, survivors of violence. Yet uh, the theater, I think, is a very powerful place that we have to have uh, an exchange to talk about violence, to collectively address stories of violence, but most importantly, to leave with a vocabulary rather than to have those stories and those vocabularies um, just given to us without any kind of space of uh, response. So I'm, I'm really excited about the work that we do here in the theater. I think it's important to probably begin with uh, why are all of the people here on this panel uh, specifically brought together to talk about issues of violence and trauma um, and writing and staging the, the stories about violence and trauma. So I want to um, in briefly introduce each uh, the panelist. You'll hear more from them about their uh, work. Um, and I want to talk about, uh, you know, you can look at their profiles online, and uh, as well as uh, their biographies online, their web pages. But I want to introduce them talking about why they've been so incredibly important to my thinking about this topic. Uh, I'm, I left home at the age of 15 fleeing uh, a home of uh, violence and uh, a, a very uh, toxic environment. And I knew at a young age that if I didn't leave, I don't think I would have survived. And various parts of my family history uh, showed that, that, that I needed to get out to survive. Um, when I left, I think one of the reasons why I survived, and I always share that story because I think sometimes when we hear people have uh, experienced issues of violence and trauma, we just hear the story of how they're processing it and how they've been broken, but we don't often see how that's a source of insight and wisdom as much as a source of wounding, and that people can actually emerge from those environments and be happy and have very productive lives. And I think the, the theater is part of that healing, but the part of the keeping us happy and sane and making those experiences generative, not just for ourselves, but for others. So for me, um, literature and theater saved my life because it showed me that the story I was experiencing was just one story. It wasn't the story of my life or the world, and that there were other stories out there. And in doing my work, the stories created by the artists here on this table are, um, are part of uh, my healing journey, part of the journey that I get to share with my students, uh, part of their connection with the work, but I think uh, they're some of the most tremendously gifted, talented storytellers on the American stage today uh, who are bravely talking about uh, their cultural experience and sharing it with us, and uh, as a lot of our playwrights have so wisely taught us, it's the things that are most specific that actually end up being the most universal. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a why about these particular panelists. To my immediate left is Dahlia Cruz, a uh, Puerto Rican playwright, New York Rican playwright from the Bronx. Uh, her work is brought together uh, in the collection of Vico del Bronx and other plays uh, published by No Passport Press. She's the author of over 52 plays. 
she's a student of Marie, uh, Maria Irene Fornes and is carrying forward the tradition of that, uh, of having studied with uh, one of our greatest writing teachers and playwrights uh, in her own work as a teacher, but also um, I think in her voice as someone who is fearless, uh, who's not afraid to play with poetic images, with metaphor, and to go to uh, very, very dark places as uh, to open up the space of insight. I'm a huge, huge um, fan of her work. A Week of the Bronx is an uh, incredibly important play about how families bear the burden of incarceration, uh, the prison industrial complex, but also generations of uh, poverty and violence and how they get passed on from father to child, and, um, and just so many other beautiful plays. Uh, but it, uh, this is our scholar's vault. I hope you'll be able to look at it and uh, look at that further. To the left of Magdalia is Adelina Anthony, uh, incredible performer, uh, solo performer, ensemble performer, playwright. Uh, her book is published, Las Mosiconas, Three Locas with Big Mouths and Even Bigger Brains. Um, <laughs> wonderful piece of solo, uh, solo drama. And comic performance, and uh, two of her plays that you may have seen in the Los Angeles area, uh, area are, and as well as nationally, are Boozing for Besos and Beast of Times, and both of those plays are uh, very much looking at um, queer Latino experience and how stories of violence have specificity in that context, as well as more uh, broadly in terms of being uh, daughters, lovers, uh, citizens of our culture, and looking at uh, the theater that we work as in Adeline's words of Medicina. Um, and I'm just really honored uh, to have Adeline be part of the work that I do with students at UCR. She uh, has had a huge influence on the next generation of artists in uh, the way that she experiments with performance and brings solo dramatic storytelling to the stage. So I'm really excited about the work that we'll hear from her today. And then to at the end of our panel is uh, John Foz Merchant, Merchant, and he's uh, representing uh, Rupert B. Hines, who was unable to be with us today. And uh, Foz is in Rupert B.'s play Dreamscape, which hopefully people in this room got to see it. <laughs> Say Word, Voices from Hip Hop Theater. Um, the, the play has evolved since the print version, but the print version will give you a very strong and powerful sense of the story. Uh, it's an incredible play that uses uh, hip hop inflected dance, beatboxing, uh, and um, experimental uh, forms of dramatic storytelling to speak about the murder of a young girl by the police. Uh, it's based on a real life story set in, in, in Riverside, California, where the police uh, riddled a young woman who was asleep in her car uh, with bullets and shot her to death. And the play is about each bullet that pierces her life and the parts of her story that were lost. Foz is an incredible actor and uh, vocal performer. I think he's vocal performer rather than beatboxer <laughs> because even people who are aficionados of beatboxing are astounded by what he's able to do with his voice. And he's going to talk with us today just about the embodiment of stories of violence, how he illustrates and bring, bring us into the realm of the scenarios of violence just through the voice and what he does with his voice and his presence. Um, so uh, it's my honor to have these three people with us today. I 
adamant about doing this as a solo performer. Uh, my work primarily is the And in, in that regard, it, it was a, a very purposeful choice because the beautiful thing about university performances, um, you know, not a local theater scene, is that you get an opportunity to have questions and answers with students. And usually they're just so excited and eager to have a conversation with the artists. And, and partly because we realize those students, that's that's the future. <laughs> those are future artists. Maybe they haven't come out as artists yet. Coming out as queer is also cosa, but <laughs> coming out as artists that we so so gracias um, for the space. And then also for me it's critical to acknowledge that I'm here as an artist because of my maestra, uh, who I worked with for many years, which is Sheree Bogata. And today is still the, the only prominent international Chicano lesbian playwright that we have. And, uh, having the opportunity to be mentored by her as well as by her fetic, uh, um, Senator Rodriguez, who is also a performance artist, um, they really had such a profound uh, influence on how my work shifted, um, in particular 10 years ago. And so Tiffany introduced me uh, as a soul performer. And I was telling her earlier that, um, or I was telling Dada earlier, that the choice to do solo performance as uh, Chicana lesbian or that two-spirited individual really was a pragmatic choice. Uh, one, because I knew the kind of topics that I wanted to address as, uh, as a writer and in the practice of violence. So like Tiffany, many of us, I could have very easily been another statistic. Um, should have been, you know, according to what is offered to us as, as young women is um, as of eight, uh, our family definitely had to contend with domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, incest, pedophilia, I mean, you name it, I feel like the isms were just, this is the, the, the violence that I was born into, that my family, um, that my family was contending with because of this history of intense colonization that is just the cycles that have been repeating themselves. Um, and with colonization, you know, the patriarchy, the sexism, and homophobia. And to that degree, like, Steph, like Tiffany, I feel that in many ways, it, it could have been um, the destruction of me as an artist, but I too gravitated to uh, theater my, my mother was extremely, I mean, we were poor, welfare kids, so she could never put me in the dance classes I wanted to <laughs> participate in, but she, would, but she was fine allowing me to stay after school. And at that time, it was, you know, get one home, they still had after school programs, UIL plays, and that was my outlet. And so, teatro very much became my safe space. It became the space where I learned that to embody other characters was also um, a relief, that I didn't have to live my own life, that for a few hours after school, you know, we're in ensayos, and I'm, I'm in someone else's life, and gosh, their life is more fucked up than mine. And, <laughs> and to a teenager, that was, I was, I was, wow. Um, so, and I'm glad that I used vulgarity, because uh, <laughs> I have to say that although I very much uh, have been entrenched in the academic studies, as well, one of the the tenets of my work is always to mix up the language and to have this juxtaposition of hyphen palabras along with what is the poesia, the musicality of my chicanidad, my chicanidad, and also what is street language. Um, and a lot of times, um, in one sentence, it's constructed in a way where you have these words that seem to, they, they, they shouldn't live together. Well, but in many ways, in that microcosm of looking at that one sentence, like in what else, like on a script or something, it's a reflection of who I am, right? That I grew up through the Bible, and uh, not the ghetto. Um, and I always say that that's because white people can't hold their R's. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't make that so barrio. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I came the barrio, you know, and, and, that, and that's also placed me in a very specific time period and the influence of the 60s, right, the Chicano theater and all that. Um, so, so along those lines, I feel like 
um, the work that I do is not so different from other artists in that the crux of drama is conflict. And we all know that as artistas. So one of the things that I'm clear about is that when I bring violence as a topic to any of my performances, it's in order to, one, make the dramatic action work in a piece, in a play, because scenes move through conflict. And two, it's about really investigating what has not been said in my communities. And so I stand on the ground unapolog unapologetically as Chicana and Jota together. And for many years, um, even when there were naysayers and, and folks who, you know, to, in, in a very, I think, well-meaning way, insisted that I had enough talent to do mainstream theater or to even do mainstream Latino theater. Um, and I knew early on that that would have been a violence mm -hmm. that I would perpetuate on myself because it would have been, again, a cutting away or a silencing. So I'm actually really happy that I made those decisions. You know, and and there, when you make choices like that, then your careers kind of go off <laughs> in a different way. And so I'm honored that Tiffany calls me among these artists on the American stages because, to be quite honest, is, uh, you really don't have what does on the big American stages or even your Latino theater stages. Um, and, and I think that that's in part due to this idea of that perhaps our work is not relatable, when in fact what has often happened by being that specific with, uh, with the craft is that of course I am writing for a very specific um, publico and audience, and, and I'm always thinking, are my Chicanas going to get this? Are my Chicana Indigena Jotas going to get this? And when I hear them laughing, or I, I, I hear the dramatic pause, and I know it's, it's getting to that intended audience, um, overwhelmingly after shows, it's also been everyone else who has come in as, as witness. So I also have a very different relationship to audience because of Moraga and Herrera Rodriguez and that that shift 10 years ago was also asking audience to be witness, and that my work became offering. That it wasn't so much about, uh, oh, I'm just gonna go do a show, this is great, I wanna talk to my peeps afterwards, you know, the, the, the applause that I think a lot of performers can get addicted to. Um, I, I have, uh, I'm actually get anxiety after shows talking to people because it's not why the work, you know, the work is, is is situated in a very conscious place of this is the body that I have to offer to this piece, to these words, and to this gathering, this circle, and these witnesses. And so as witness, it's again building on all those years of Agostoval and Andrew Proko saying you're not passive, right? You come to theater saying you are, you're my audience. And so I'm still following along those veins and bringing the work um, I'm just keeping it grounded in, uh, in a space that is looking at an experience that is not delimiting in any way, because the way I look at it is by putting works that are queer, Chicana, feminist, um, indígena, putting all of these elements together holistically means that it's an opportunity for people to enter the work through those different spaces, as opposed to saying like, well, I don't know anything about Chicano Jota, right? but the brother could be Chicano, and that's enough to get him in at least culturally or linguistically. So I'm going to kind of pause it there and leave it open for specific questions later because these are wonderful for me to Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I hear you, you know, the question, uh, the implicit question that I want to make explicit is thinking about well, what is the role of violence in your work? And I hear you saying violence is a, is a lever, it's a springboard, but it's, it's also an undercurrent. Um, it's something that you respond to, but also continually processing. Well, I think that we don't, um, we don't ever escape violence, even people who maybe did not that many of us have experienced, like you said, we live in a, in a violent society. So I'm always processing what I've survived. I'm kind of going back to that moment of like, wow, I'm not that, I left home at 17. I'm not that 17-year-old teenager 
who was one, homophobic, two, Hispanic identified, three, a uh, complete like mess, and only, <laughs> <laughs> not too sure that that's changed too much, but, <laughs> but, but it has, right? So the process has been about um, going through the work. So for me, in a very humbling and true way, I, I would like to think that my work helps others. And, and I've had some audience members say, your work saved my life, you know, or it, it helped them come out, or helped them deal with their families. But in truth, I'm here because my work is saving my life. Thank you. Um, we're now gonna hear from uh, I'm turn to Dahlia to, um, and ask her the, do you want me to wait for it to last? Well, for some reason. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and ask the, 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 well, I don't know. To ask her to talk about the role of violence in her work, because I, I feel like aesthetically, um, as a storyteller, you know, studying under Mary Fornes, uh, you've talked about in the past about how she really, um, uh, really pushed you to be able to go into a place of incredible honesty, and what that meant for you to come to terms with that place of incredible honesty could also be a place of grappling with very difficult and dark things and over you know the span of your fifth year of a, years of a playwright producing over 52 plays really um, just the incredible lyricism that you've been able to evoke the honesty and pressing stories about talking about issues of scarification issues of imprisonment um, issues of uh, uh, serial violence you know serial murderer and what would make a young girl open the door to somebody like that and let someone like that in their life. So I, I, I was hoping that you would um, uh, share with us just thinking about the, the role of violence throughout your career for over 52 plays. When Tiffany asked me to be on this panel, the first thing I thought of was like, I read about violence? <laughs> <laughs> it's something that never occurred to me that I do. <laughs> something that is like, it's like a lesson you want to teach people or um, your overriding um, message. And violence isn't the message, survival is the message. Um, healing is the message. Love is the message. And it's like, we go through these horrible things, every single one of us, whether, you know, Latino or not. And it's like, we need to address our truths. And sometimes our truths are hard in dark places. And sometimes there are places where you can offend your family members because you're, you're, you're telling the story, you're giving the cheese play, you're, you're talking about chinche about people you shouldn't open your mouth about. But <laughs> well, we're not those type of people. Or we don't want people to know we're that type of people, so keep your mouth shut. Or that never happened to you, it didn't happen that way. No, it happened to me, it didn't happen to you. <laughs> that happens in my family all the time. It's like, is that my story or is that your story? <laughs> Whose story is that? <laughs> and, but the fact is, like, like, I write fiction, I write plays. <laughs> So I hope if, if, I'm a, if, if I'm worthy of, of being a playwright that I'm writing everyone's story, mm -hmm. that I'm trying to create a world that is, that is filled with many emotions and violence is incidental. It happens to be how those people went through life. Um, so that's, that was my first question. I was like, I don't think I should be in that panel. <laughs> but, um, but I guess I do. I think people, I've been told I write about blood. It's like, how do you write about blood? It's red. You don't write about blood. You write about the letting of blood. You write about the, the bandage you put on top of the wound that's bleeding. And, uh, and so in the course of, of all of my work, I think I've tried to create a place that's safe for people to, to be as ugly as they can be and they can do it in a beautiful way that also um, addresses their poetry, and the poetry of poverty. The poetry of people, I should say better, the poetry of people who happen to be poor. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think in my early, my early days of writing, people often confront me about, well, how can, people don't, people don't talk that way in the South Bronx. I thought, well, yeah, they do, I do, and I'm from there. Yeah. So, so how do you, how, why are you denying me my poetry? 
So for me, finding a, you know, so the more, the most violent part of my existence as a playwright has always been the confrontation with people trying to identify my work as something they can identify easily as opposed to something that they can embrace and absorb and maybe learn about later. <laughs> that you don't have to uh, label things. That actually a, a theatrical journey has many parts and many themes. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I love that. Uh, it makes me think of um, uh, it, just really why I think to, why for me it's important to think about focusing on stories of violence that we're telling, not just reductively about violence, that it's not just about that thing. I think in the larger culture, any Latino actor or actor of color knows. Um, has talked about, you know, you go into an audition and people want to put you in a box and have you play a certain kind of role. And the reality is a lot of the roles that we are stereotyped in are attached to performances of violence. But I think the difference in our theater is exactly what you just identified. It's not just about the theme of violence. It's about processing trauma. It's about attaching it to love. It's about having a space for uh, great amounts of complexity, but also the poetry and the visual artistry. Uh, in the conversation we open up, we have several uh, directors and designers in this room, and uh, I hope that you'll launch in to pick up with exactly some of the uh, comments uh, Medallia made about the poetry of it. Um, I want to turn to hearing from Foz um, about how, as a perf vocal performer, just uh, how you use the voice to really put us in an emotional landscape of processing stories of violence, specifically through Rickerby Hines' dreamscape. But I've also heard you talk before about uh, how that's had you really tap into, um, it's opened up a space for you to really think about your own histories of processing violence and the kinds of complexities that you arrive at through the performance. And, and I'm hoping that you'll layer that in, but also maybe give us an illustration of, um, of how you use your instrument to really um, process the story that you're telling through dreamscape. Absolutely. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I need the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> And here it is, you know, I'm 
17, 18, I, like, I, I wanted to break his neck, you know, and I did it, needless to say, I'm still here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but beatboxing became one of those things. I've always struck when I was 12 years old, and a lot of people didn't know how exactly it was like 12 years <laughs> old. And, and most people think, oh, that's, that's actually cool. You know, I wish I no, you don't. You really don't, because you can't call a girl's house at the age of 12. <laughs> Craving before he got behind me. 
Driving down the street, he gets behind me. Now, I still want chicken, so I'm going to get it. When I get to the light to where it is, there's a double line. I'm not going to cross over there because now I see you're behind me. I'm not going to give you a reason to do anything. So I make a left. Still double lines. I'm not going to cross over these double lines because you're behind me. You're still behind me. Let me make sure that I do the right thing and try to find a place where I can turn around. I do exactly that. One too many turns, he hits his lights on me. All right, that's cool. I, I get it. I seem a little suspicious at this point. But why are you following me is the question that I'm asking. Gets off the car, hey, license, registration, and insurance. I hand him my license. It's my mom's car. I don't know where the registration or the proof of insurance is. Okay, that's cool. You still need those two things. Where are you going? Well, I wanted chicken. <laughs> but it's back there. Yeah, but I didn't want to make a wrong turn. And were you afraid? Afraid of what? Why should I be afraid? Well, because I was behind you. I have nothing to be afraid of, sir. Nothing at all. All right. He goes and runs my license. He still hasn't had the insurance or registration. Still doesn't have those things. Comes back, my mom is neat free. The car is completely clean. He's searching through, so you, uh, you ever been to jail? You ever been arrested? No, none of that, sir. You uh, have any marijuana, paraphernalia, blah, blah, blah? No, I don't smoke, sorry. Uh, you have any uh, guns or uh, grenade? <laughs> I'm being this here. I don't lie. I can't lie with this voice. Uh, <laughs> do you have a bazooka in the car? This is, a, this is a true story. I wish that I could make this up. I wish I could. A bazooka. I wanted to be smart, but I, I knew that there was something that he was, you know what I mean? Because it's one of those things, somebody asks you to get a bazooka, it's like, oh yeah, I, I actually left it here. They had a two for one sale at this yard sale. I went to this the questions are, and it makes you think, like, do they ask everybody this question? You know? Um, then he tried to have small talk, and you know, obviously, I came back clean. You never, you never got proof of insurance or the registration. You never told me why you pulled me over. You never told me these things. But it's up to me to understand, like, okay, like me acting out and, and, and being enraged, like, what does that do? It doesn't do anything. Me telling everybody, oh, you know, after the police, because in hip hop, that's that's the thing to do. That's cool. So like, F, F authority. We don't, we don't need that. We don't. But if my sister gets into a domestic dispute, I'm going to rely on the police to be there, to, to help her. Because they don't want me to do it. <laughs> you know, you know. But it's one of those things where it's like, OK, like how do I get rid of that anger and that type of thing, having guns pulled on me and ask stupid questions? Like, I can't betray a police officer because that's what I'm accustomed to. That's what I'm accustomed to. And then getting into this role with, with Dreamscape, it was, a, it was a, a moment to where I, I started to realize when Kirby actually had the opportunity to meet with the officer whose testimony he used at Arbitrary. And that opened up the humanity in it to where it's like, okay, every officer isn't bad. They are. Everybody isn't bad. There's people that take advantage of the opportunities that they're given and they don't do the right things with them. Like asking people to have a super in the car. This, this, I mean, it's just wrong. But that's, he, he, that one incident shouldn't illustrate every single officer. You know, the, the officer that I betrayed, he made a mistake. He thought he heard a boom. He made a mistake. He started shooting. Everybody else started shooting. Was it right? No. Does, should it be justified? I don't think so. But for me to stand on stage and to try to illustrate, and again, push through this avenue, all of my disgustingness, and not allow that to be the, the, you know, the point of departure to say, you know what, listen, this bad stuff happens, but how can we make it better? How can I take this bad experience and make it something that can be enlightening? And I did exactly that. I found a way to balance that, you know, the negativity and to make it something that can be enlightening to people. And by doing so, it's helped audience members, especially ones who, again, have brothers and cousins and fathers who are police officers who are just trying to make an honest living, who their everyday waking up is to protect and serve. You know, and so it's 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 wrong for me to use my biasness to try to illustrate that. Um, my voice just being an, an unfair advantage um, becomes a, a very dynamic presence because 
it's 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 almost like God talking to you in a sense. You know, it's <laughs> and I say that facetiously, but it's it's one of those things in the play. You know, it's this it's this girl that has been shot at 23 times, 12 of those hitting her, three of them being fatal, and it's like you know this voice. It's almost commanded. It it it, de it demands and commands. You know, and it's one of those things that says you have to listen to the information that I'm giving you. This is what happened to her. This is how it destroyed her. And how are we going to make it better? You know. And so, utilizing this gift has been such an honor and a pleasure to be able to beatbox and to be able to use my, you know, my skills and and this voice to be able to be heard. And you know, and, and to say something that that can transform someone's way of thinking. I read a quote that said, you know, you can you can only change what people know. You can't change what they do. But giving them that information will hopefully influence them and encourage them to make those changes in their everyday lives. And uh, yeah, that's I think that's great for that. <laughs> it's really powerful um, to hear that and uh, have that perspective about the performance. And I was just thinking from the point of view of uh, a playwright and a, a, a playwright performer, just thinking about how your work is taken up by other people to uh, continue what you hope will happen in the storytelling. I want to um, be mindful of uh, time and create a space for the dialogue with the audience. Uh, as you can see, our panelists are incredibly generous. One of us, you know, all three of them have uh, been so generous in coming out to UC Riverside and speaking with students, but uh, in my own career, McDelia, when I was a graduate student, I sent out a very naive request. I, I thought I was writing about uh, dissertation on representations of uh, violence in Latino drama, and I sent out a call to the Hispanic um, Arts Foundation, the Association for Hispanic Arts in New York, uh, just cold call it was before the internet to ask playwrights could they contact, would they be interested in my writing about them? And Magdalia was the first person to contact me and send me her work. Um, and so it's just incredible to have people of such generosity here on this panel. So I want to open it up to the audience to um, respond to some of what you've heard, but also to ask questions specifically about their work or uh, their thinking about staging and telling uh, stories in the same. Dr. Huerta. Uh, thank you all for the wonderful, wonderful, insightful comments. Um, Adelina, I was quite taken, I hadn't heard you say this before, that if you had gone into the so-called mainstream and even the Latino theater mainstream, you would have been doing violence against yourself. Mm -hmm. And I heard other people responding to that a little rule or all. Might you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I feel that um, it's been interesting throughout the years, um, you know, because I, I spent a greater part of my, I think my formative years of experience at the Vista, um, the first play that I directed through the company that I co-founded in Dallas, Academia Theater Company, was Shiri Shadow of a Man. And, uh, and, and, I, and I spent well over a, a decade, or more so, collaborating with Morag in those plays. And it was always interesting to me that during auditions, um, I would have other Latinas or Chicanas come up to me and uh, and ask, you know, well, let me let me take it back actually. Even while we were at Stanford, there were individuals who were not Latinas, they were not Chicanas, um, uh, Anglo identified, and here's when we're trying to authentically, right? And I'm putting quotes because I know that it can be a problematic statement, <laughs> but to do justice to the work. And they come up to me and be like, I, I, I want to audition. I was like, great, audition. But you may not get the role because we're looking for someone Chicana. And you know, and the, I think it's a, it's a complicated conversation and it's appropriate to have in our day and age because um, when I was coming of, of age in theater, Latinos were fighting to do Latino roles. And then when, you know, it'd be us looking for Queers, who are also Chicanos Latinos, those same Latinos would come up to me like, why is that important? Like, you know, does it matter? And I'd throw back the question, well, does it matter to have a Latina play a Latina role when there'd be Anglo women 
vying for the same position. And you know, although authenticity is, is problematic terrain, there's something to be said about insider knowledge. And there's something to be said about <coughs> all those years of auditions, and even to recently, like trying to cast for our feature film and finding an incredible ally to work opposite. I always have to remind the other women who are playing these roles, hey, I'm acting too. You know, I know I'm the hot end, you know, and, and this is a, a lesbian role, but this is still acting. And so when I talk about it would have been violence on my own persona is that quite often, if you think about the Latino experience in the terrain of American theater, we have been asked to be silent, or why are you doing Latino theater? Why do you have to do your identity politics on the stage? And so I'm surprised sometimes when Latinos don't extend that kind of experience over to what it means to do queer Chicana theater, right? And, and to, to be asked to be silent about a, a part of our experience that is defining because of the kind of society that we live in. I mean, we've made great strides, but I still have people in my very close communities getting killed for who they love or who they sex. And um, so, so it has been critical to stand on this ground of not internalizing that violent act of silence. Because in the same way these traumas that we're talking about, what the works do um, in many ways is break the silence. And in, in breaking the silence, it is that transgressive part of our art making. For me, I feel that I really began to understand what it meant to do transgressive art when these um, experiences, which are mine and they're also not mine, which I love that Vidal brought up the familia because I deal with that too with my familia, especially saying like, is that about so-and-so? And actually getting very angry because they assume that it's, I was like, I was like, I don't think so. It's like, I'm going to borrow from everything, but everything's a composite. Um, that, uh, that the transgressive part in art making, in taking these taboo subjects and putting them out in the world publicly, turns it into art and the poisons and the toxins that we're supposed to keep and ingest and stay quiet about are actually expelled. And they're expelled in art form, right? So it may have therapeutic effect, but I'm not interested in doing therapy with my audience. I wanna make the best work possible. And in making the best work possible, um, whether it's a comedic vein or dramatic vein or, or a combination, you take people through a journey. Um, so, so that's why it's, it's always been important to, to know at, a, at an early age in my political consciousness that I could not internalize the fear that others had about what it meant to be um, adamantly Chicana lesbian in my work. And so the reason I said it's important to talk about it as an actor is that, you know, even if you think about the what's happening now with, with film or, you know, when people are demanding like, hey, we have trans actors or individuals and they're not getting those roles. I like to think of it in some ways in like a gentrification in this way. So because white America has always had this sense of entitlement and it is acting and actors believe as we should that we, should, we need to embody every role possible. White America, white actors, have had the opportunities to play anything and everything, right? From historically black face to brown face to yellow face, which is brown face and yellow face still being done. And it's a gentrification of our roles, <laughs> of our experiences, and like gentrification, it doesn't work the other way around. You know, there was the colorblind era of the 90s, and you know, that had its, its issues, but more often than not, you're not gonna take a, like I know that if I wanna play a head role because politically it's been important to be Chicana lesbian, I have to write it and play it and prove yet again that no, this is acting. I have no interest in playing a head role, but, um, but so, so I think that it's fodder for how we think about um, whether, whether violence is part of the story and then also what happens to get those stories produced. Like I would, I'm always asking Medina when I see her, there's this play Salt that I had an opportunity to do at a Stanford graduate. I think it's an incredible play and I wish it would get a professional production. But I feel that, you know, because she's so brave in the topics and where she goes with the stories that she's telling, there's still fear around that, about seeing ourselves um, even in this playground. 
right? Where we're supposed, it's supposed to be cathartic. You're supposed to walk away from it. And so there's a, I, I feel that there's a consistent violence done to writers who are willing <coughs> to not play it safe. And so that's the challenge I would throw back to Latino theater and, and communities is like, okay, how do you really support on a professional level these artists who are pushing ground? Uh, I want to bring up Maricel. Are you here, Maricel? Is that you here? So, uh, do you want to ask your question? Uh, we were talking uh, earlier. We had the pleasure with uh, McDally and I to talk with Maricel, and just to segue from Adelina's uh, uh, commentary a minute ago, she asked. You know, we hear so many stories of violence through journalism, through media, you know, we experience in our own families. The question that she asked that I, that I want to uh, uh, pause it to Medallia is, why go to the theater to engage in stories of violence when you know a play is about violence that we're already steeped in? Why would you choose to go to the theater to engage in stories of violence rather than escape from stories of violence? Right. Well, I think I already touched on that. I think we're not writing just about violence. Obviously, I think if it's artistic, then it's then it's it's about healing. So the the, the question is, as an audience member, do you want to just escape, or do you actually want to have uh, an internal, deep, and visceral experience? And with any artist, you know, we always want you to have a visceral experience. We don't want to just entertain you. And some people just want to entertain. But uh, but if we, you know, when we have difficult journeys. You know, like I don't, you know, was saying she doesn't like to talk after her plays because she feels like she, you know, has, you know, already showed that. I always feel that too. I feel like I already showed you my visceral. Why do you want to see my face? <laughs> you, know, you, can say, you already saw that thing. Oh my God! Why do you want to see this weird little face? And I think sometimes people are. Uh, I went when I was at Sundance the first time. I was there with a play. One of my first plays called Lillian, which is about a a girl who uh, gets pregnant when she's a teenager and. Uh, and it's um, and the uh, father of the of the baby is a, is a junkie that dies in her arms, and it's about her journey into poverty with the baby and trying to keep this baby alive. And in the end, we have to question: Is the baby even alive? What is she keeping in this box that she's she's putting all this love into? So I went to Sundance with this play, and so I met my director there for the first time. It was a very nice white man, and he met me. And he was like. Are you McDonald? I was like, yeah. She was like, and he sort of made a joke to the guy. I thought she'd be wearing leather and carrying a knife. I was like, well, I left the knife in my luggage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I don't fit into my luggage jacket anymore. <laughs> so he just sort of looked at me like, is she serious? Does she have a knife? I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, well, you write, you write such such violent, visceral images, and you're, there's so much you know visceral language in your play. I just, I, I didn't expect you to look like you know a nice. You just thinking like a nice what? You didn't think I was going to be a nice person because I write about not nice. It would it infuriated me because I'm, I'm writing I'm writing so directly, especially that time when I was a young writer, so directly about what sort of autobiographical stuff. I was like, what fine fucked up language and world is the theater world that they <laughs> that they don't see that? It's as if you were afraid to meet Shakespeare because you wrote this play about a guy who kills his father. So that guy must always have poison on him, or a knife. It's like nobody says that. It's it's fiction, and it's poetry, and it's uh, and it's the retelling of stories that are universal stories. And uh, so what the hell was the point? So what what my mother was saying of uh, that she often felt that when we talk about violence that's, that we're getting reduced to that that type. Is it reductive to show these stories of violence? And for me, it's, I don't set out to write a story of violence. I write, a, I, I write characters, and they happen to have, sometimes they don't have that violent of background, <laughs> but sometimes they do. And, uh, and why it's important to see that, if you see it every day in your everyday life, in the media all the time, you live in a violent world, is because we cannot not face our own truths all the time. And as artists, we're sort of, that's, that's sort of our, um, what's that word, it's our mandate to really write those stories that tells the truth about our experience on this planet. 
And as soon as we start writing entertainment, it ain't that entertaining, really. And it's also the kind of thing that you can go and see, and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to eat outdoors. You had no experience. You didn't really live and breathe with your actors. You didn't really live and breathe with the language. And you didn't uh, allow yourself that moment of um, recognition that, oh, I was on stage. Oh, I understand that. Hey, oh, that's why I do that. Oh, that was my mother. Oh, you know, and, it's not, and it, it, it's not, it breaks down. It's not about gender or, um, <laughs> or ethnicity. It really is about are we ready, prepared to enter a world uh, fully as human beings and take a human journey. And every, you know, all of us always have that, like incredible human journeys and we need, to, we need to tell those stories and it's important to tell them. It's not because we want to be you know, identified as, you know, we are the Bible peoples. And but we are, I mean, that happened to be a Sundance, right? I was supposed to be carrying a damn life. I was like, I should have brought my knife because <laughs> apparently, then I'm legitimate. Then I'm, re I'm really ready to write the story because I am that story every minute of every day. And we're not, because we're human beings. And we actually like to laugh <laughs> and like to dance and like to have fun. And you know, you're often accused of being too loud or you dress too, too brightly for like normal people. It's like, that's not necessarily Latino. I know lots of Latinos who love to wear black. So why do you, <laughs> so why do you, why do you, why is there this, this urge to define us all the time? The definition, it will always separate you. It will keep us separate as people. And that's why you keep thinking, you, you, you know, it's, I have lots of friends like, oh, it's such a multicultural world and everybody loves everybody and we're all, you know, it's like, really, is it? It's such a beautiful dream, and uh, for me, it's always going to be a dream. And I also, I really appreciate my friends who are different from me. Mm -hmm. I like <laughs> hanging out with, you know, hearing Annalena's story, and you know, and other stories. I'm sorry, I'm Dreamscape sounds fantastic, but but it's also a story that's familiar to me. I grew up in the Bronx in the '70s, and it was nothing but gangs, and it was always, you know, it was always Puerto Rican against black, and. Um, so it's a, you, you understand, and then the police would question never trust them, we still don't. Um, and yet we have police in our families, so what's my point? My point is, you can't say, we can't do those stories of violence. We need to do the stories that move us. We happen to be ones that, <laughs> that have some sort of violent journeys, but why do they become, why do you see them mostly on their stages? Maybe because they're dramatic, like Hamlet, like Macbeth like Medea, like, you know, it's like, theater is dramatic. <laughs> Otherwise it's boring, mm -hmm. or it's entertaining. And so there you go, I'm sorry. And, and I think, uh, I think uh, one of the things that theater does, and maybe why theater and looking at the theme of violence have such a symbiosis, is um, violence takes away our ability to be present and to have a voice, and the theater is completely about making us present with the actors and about our coming into voice through the delivery of the story but also our experiencing the storytelling and and that we see ourselves on stage and we leave the public forum that we're able to talk about it so i think you're right there's a, there's something very organic there not an imposed thematic and, and i just want to add um i gravitate towards theater precisely because of what the media says about us. Because they're not giving us the full story or the complexity. They are giving us judgment. Like you said, right. like, this is, here's another violent story of the neighborhood, but by it's usually sound bites. And I find that when I come and experience and witness these works where my humanity is on display, then it, it becomes what I got to say, that yeah, the violence is there, Move, working usually as that, you know, moving those scenes along and, and the trauma that the characters are working through, but you get character, you know, and you get these other sides of, of our peoples that a news bite is not going to give you, or even a, an article in the paper. Um, so I feel like it's the antidote to everything else that's in the cybersphere, blogosphere, whatever, whatever that sphere is called. <laughs> I, I definitely want to piggyback, I mean, and confirm everything that they just said. And uh, it is one of those things to where, even you know, with our piece, it opens up that dialogue and allows us to have a conversation to say, "This is happening." You know, um, Kirby oftentimes he'll say, "You know, 
when he was writing the plays, how do you get someone to sit for an hour and just get hit in the head with another gunshot, another gunshot, another gunshot, another gunshot? And it's consistently going, but it's one of those things to where, as she said, the media, when they covered the story, they, you know, even the officer that reached out to her, Kirby, he said, well, I hope, you know, the playwright did his research and mentions that the girl had GHP in her system and that she was a member of a gang and it's this and it's that. And even if we look at the stories that are projected now in the media with, you know, the Ferguson incident, the Trayvon Martins and endless other stories, they try to attack the character of that person as in to validate why they are gone. Like, they're gone because he was messing up in school and because he was smoking weed and he's gone because he just shoplifted and so he deserves to be gone. Taisha Miller deserved to be dead because she had guns in her trunk and she had a gun in her lap. Well, the gun was inoperable. And the beauty of, of the piece in presenting it in theater is to allow the audience and whoever that has never heard this story before sit and, and understand like this is just a human being. And if someone would have taken a moment to just stop and think for a minute, that person possibly could still be here. And they could contribute something to the society. And so again, it's, you know, it's going back, you know, the media only gives you what they want to give you. Whereas with theater, we have the opportunity as artists to express that there's more to the story, there's another side, and to open up that dialogue. With, I mean, we did this play in Poland, and you know, we thought, oh, there might be a language barrier. No, they got it. They, the only thing that they might have missed was Riverside references or American culture, things that are embedded within our society. But other than that, they understood the story, they understood the new musicality, and they gravitated towards it. They knew, like, as soon as we got off stage and started to have these conversations, the story started to pour out. Hey, I live in this area over here, and we just experienced this many deaths, and we have this relationship with the police. And so it's this universal thing to where it's like, okay, now we're bonding because you're dealing with the same thing I'm dealing with. And vice versa, for people that may live in a bubble, because everybody may not watch the news, or they may feel comfortable because they live in an isolated area. If it's happening, happening over there, it doesn't apply to me. But with theater, it's, it, we're able to say, hey, this is happening regardless if you know it or not, or if you want to pay attention to it or not. Listen, if you want to contribute, so be it. But now you are aware of what's happening. It, I, I would say, too, it's, um, I don't want us to forget that, because even when the plays are hard, one of the strategies that I know I, I personally love when other writers do it too, there's a lot of comedic medicina in our violence as well. And I remember talking about this the last time we discussed it, how critical it is to have the carcajadas and the humor, right? Because nobody's here writing just this dirge because that's bad writing, you know, if you're just going um, one intense tone. Like you, you become tonally deaf than to what's happening on the stage. So you do use these strategies as writers and as performers of when is the moment of respite so that the audience can just you know, laugh and open up for a moment and then you take them back in. So there, there's also all kinds of writing styles to address um, these issues of, of survival. You know? So yeah, but it's just also not comedy. It's also in the theater you get to breathe mm -hmm. with actors. Mm -hmm. So even when you take that breath and you take that moment to think about what you're seeing, to think about um, what you're experiencing, to think about the things you need to fix for yourself and know that you're not alone because you've actually breathed in uh, another world and it actually becomes part of your own. That's so different than reading something in a newspaper because mm -hmm. they, whatever they say in a newspaper, you can always burn a newspaper. You know, although there are some theaters that have been burned. But, uh, <laughs> but you're probably not going to get up and throw a match at, the, at the, that particular production. Um, yeah. Well, um, I just kind of wanted to make a comment. It's, it's interesting, you know, we talk about violence and, and you know, your birth is violent. It's, I mean, it's, it's very traumatic, right? And like before a flower blooms, it's like everything's just bah! right? And I think what the work that I've seen here, when there's violence or whatever, there's, we get to see a little bit of the bloom, and we get to see a little bit of the birth and the possibilities of what comes from the, from the violence and the beautiful parts that can happen. I mean, 
the Rickerby piece, the Rickerby piece, the, the dreamscape with Pause. I mean, I think it was amazing because I could, I got to see possibility and after the violence and, and, and when these tragic things happen. And I think it's important to, to give that possibility or, you know, como nos curamos, you know what I mean, in that way. And I just, it's just this violent, like Adelina's saying, it's not just, it's just not just that. There's that bloom. There's that, or the possibility of that bloom. And I think that's what makes powerful theater. Because if not, then we're, we're not going to want to go to theater. Right? Cause it's just, right? And the carcajada is part of that bloom. You know, it's part of the birth. And so um, I think it's important you know, that in our theaters that we, that we kind of at least offer that kind of thing. And Adelina, you're awesome, man. I, 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 I you know, I, you, I, I can't see because of the loose I recognize. It's Ruben. Ruben. Uh, hi, hi, Ruben. Hey, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I, you know, I'm not a queer Chicana, but I love your shit. <laughs> 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 like, I, 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 I get it, I laugh at it, I think it's great with that show you do with D-Lo, right? Yeah. She's awesome. But, you know, but the way, he, 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 I'm sorry, you see, I'm, so that's all horrible. <laughs> no. But, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, 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 it's human. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's that's why we go to theater, to get a human experience. You know, because we see you, and we see your face, and then we could have put, we could put a face on whatever the news puts on it. They just put words, and we actually get to see a, a human being. Well, thank you. I'm a fan yeah. of your solo works. So. Yes. Tony, yes. you yes. have your hand. Uh, I wanted to make a comment, maybe ask you to respond to it. Um, so I was, I was thinking about um, how violence in, in the mainstream is, is a lot gratuitous, right? Uh, you, can, you can put Tarantino, and I don't hear the same criticism that, uh, and, and about him portraying violence, right? Some people actually think it's artistic and such, right? But it seems like what I'm walking away from this conversation is that when violence, is, when violence by the, the, the dominant cultures when against us is being portrayed, there's a lot less sensitivity about it, right? It's, it's almost funny, it's almost entertaining, it's almost, it has, it's, it's, it has really very little effect. However, it seems like what you, you're, you're doing and portraying it on our stage is, is that we're portraying violence against ourselves as well, that's being committed against ourselves. And it seems to me that by in doing that, you actually give a face to ourselves as perpetrators of violence and victims of violence. But it seems like there's that, 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 that disconnect, that imbalance of, of those in power, the powerful committing violence against the powerless, is minuscule. It doesn't mean anything. It is only when we take it into our hands and have that conversation that we then have faces, that we then are able to respond to it, that we then have farces. But within, if we're waiting for that to happen within the dominant culture, it doesn't. And yet, when we portray it, there's a criticism of you're only portraying that life. Why are we still 
still in there by Mammy. I think we are in two businesses here. We are in the memory business and we are in the identity business. Yeah. And so by putting those faces, I mean, what you do is you put a face on them, and I think that is harder for for the dominant, for the, those in power, for the power, and I say dominant culture, but it's the power. It's the power that when, when, when those in power commit violence against, violence against those with that power, it's so much easier when we are faceless. And by giving us a face, you can't, you, there's an element, I think, that you challenge that, and I'm asking, is that something you can respond to? Is that something part of the intent, part of the result, part of, part of the process? I mean, I think it's a little bit of everything. Uh, dealing with hip hop culture, when you examine hip hop, you know, um, I was sharing earlier right before this started how you look at like the earlier stages of hip hop, how it was very, you know, revolutionary. And you wanted to, you know, everybody wanted to step against what was happening, the powers that be, and, and you know, let's fight the power, different things of that nature. Then you had artists like NWA who came out. And when you look at them for face value, it's like, oh, well, here are these, you know, these criminals and thugs are carrying guns and blah, blah. But if you're listening to what they're saying, it's like, this is what's happening in our neighborhood. You guys are forgetting about us. Like, we're coming from Compton. Like, we're not only, yeah, you know, there is a, a sense of, you know, perpetuating the violence, but at that time it was like, listen, this is what they're doing to us. This is how we're being, you know, marginalized. You know, they're just trying to put us here, you know, but we're bigger than that. And then all of a sudden, once they start making ruckus and people start paying attention, then all of a sudden they were a threat. You know, they were on FBI's most wanted list, but they're saying, like, this is what it is. I hate the fact that hip hop has turned into one of those things to where it went from being, let's let's stand up against the power and let's let's try to make a change within ourselves and uplift to now it's one of those things to where you have youth and people that are looking at it and trying to emulate those things in a negative sense. To where it's no longer there is no more value within women. There's no more value within community that's being said, you know, or being commercialized. It's almost like they fill for the bait. To where some you have artists now that say, oh yeah, you know what? Let's just go out and party. Let's do this. Let's, you know, let's, it's okay to kill somebody. It's okay to do this. You know, it, it's wrong. I don't personally. I don't. I don't agree with it. You know, I personally don't even really listen to, to hip hop music. But it is one of those things to where. You know, hopefully I'm answering your question. Um, it, it is one of those things that that does need a response, and you do need to at least acknowledge it. You know, because you know, with hip hop, it's it has the power to cross over those bounds, and it's you know, with our piece, you know, we get the question asked. You know, is there a reason why I portray the officer when clearly he wasn't of color? Well, once you do that, you take away. If I were if I were white playing this part it then becomes about white men killing black people versus power against power. The very first play that we did, or the very first performance that we did was in my hometown of Pomona, a very diverse crowd. When we got through with the play, the, the emotion that arose in the audience, which was very diverse, you had Latinos, you had blacks, you had whites, you had Asian, everybody stood up and talked about their experience. You know, and needless to say, it's not just white killing black. It, it's everybody. And it's the, the, the issue at hand is how do we get it to stop? How do we get it to stop? So presenting that, I mean, we present it in the best way possible. You know, with the plan, again, taking you on that journey to where you can see the life of this character. You know, but it's, it's bigger than that. How do we get that issue to stop? Hopefully that... It comes back to the earlier comment about the things that are most culturally specific are the things that allow us to really press on the universal question or problem, why that's going on. And I think also in, in white theater, mainstream theater, there is always, well, in my, with my plays, there is, there is a certain kind of energy and darkness that is really scary to most people. So I feel most of those people but I feel like when I when my place presented in a Latino theater with a Latino audience, with a Latino cast, those questions, the same questions don't come up about why I'm writing it. It's more like, did I did I do a good job or not? Did I portray those people honestly? Was it, you know, is 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 did I find the beauty in the in the in the darkness or in the ugliness? Whereas when I when when it goes outside of our community, there is this, there is this feeling that you're supposed to like defend what you're doing. 
and it's um, and it's a difficult thing to, to, to deal with on a daily basis. Because it can make you stop writing, it can make you stop performing, it can make you stop going in the theater. But you're like, they don't get it, and I'm never going to be paid enough to to do it for fun because it's not what excites me as a as an artist. I don't want to just write for money. I don't want to just do these. I, want, I actually want to actually. I feel like I want to write poetry in the theater and. I want it to be about people who don't normally have voices in the theater. And that, that becomes sort of why you do it. But that doesn't mean that I expect that, you know, it's gonna get done someplace else. Um, I, I was also going to say that I'm really glad that you brought up the comment about memory and identity because um, I don't get caught up with people who say they're over identity politics precisely because of the specificity, precisely because identity is tied to memory. So when I identify as queer Chicana, I might also culturally attaching myself to memoria that has not been necessarily presented on stage. And that part of my agenda, if I have an agenda, is to make memory, make visible what has been forgotten by others in my community. So they're, in ex they're, they're interwoven in, in such a way, and I, um, I think that the, the whole idea of like identity policies or devices, that's, that's coming from, the again, the hegemonic culture who would have us without identity so we can assimilate and then attach ourselves to white America's memory, you know? But yo tengo memoria, and I love. I mean, she has memoria, he has memoria, and I want to be um, respectfully present in the memories of others' identities. And, and that's coming from a place, you know, you have to issue any kind of imperialistic impulse to come into our our stories and our theaters, and be okay not knowing, be okay not being in the center of the knowledge base, you know, and um, and so so of course that's that's what we should be doing, and um, I, I agree and want to echo Mindaria that at some point, I think years ago, I just not that I stopped caring about what people were going to say because I've had some people be very angry with me because. I use the word jota and proclaim violent language as a queer, um, and, and they don't understand it. Why would you call yourself that? And I was like, because I am. <laughs> and I'm very good at it, thank you. <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, and that, if, and that those, those acts of reclamation are, are, part, of the, are part of the work. And, um, and that my job, again, was not to worry so much about the critics, about the content, but I'm listening, you know, I have my cadre of, of artists and people whose opinions I care about in terms of the form and the artistry behind it. Um, so it, it's kind of a way where you filter. I have a, a question for the gentleman. You said, uh, you made a statement saying that Quentin Tarantino gets praised. Uh, and, and I think in some places criticized the most people. I obviously he's gotten wealthy. Absolutely. Uh, I, I personally do appreciate most of his work. Uh, just recently, I know the, the movie Django, which was kind of like one of those things that was, it was daring, which uh, needless to say, was very daring. Um, I don't know, I, I think I appreciate more or less him presenting that. Did I feel offended? Not necessarily, because I think going back to that identity, I don't identify with that. You know, he used the N-word probably a million times in that movie. You know, um, but it's it, the way that I looked at it was it was something that happened. It was a part of history and a part of a memory. Should it be relived? No. But I don't. I mean, I don't feel as though that he necessarily gets praised more than other playwrights or directors or anything. We are uh, we're on our last uh, minute to have a closing comment or a question for the panelists. Stephanie? Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about staging these works that are sometimes explicitly about violence in newspapers, sometimes implicitly in the and you don't set out to write stories of violence, it just so happens that it's like an undercurrent theme. Um, and most of the time, there we see solo performance or two people performance, like uh, these are times where there's people get solo and drinks. And a lot of the time, you see this sort of minimalist, bare bones staging. So I want to ask you as playwrights, theater makers, and actors, what goes into the, those aesthetic decisions to have it very specifically only having certain things on the stage? I'll, I'll start answering that. Um, 
one of the most important things I learned uh, at my time in Stanford with Muraga was the concept of body as text. So as a solo performer and then even the two-person shows, when, when I'm conceptualizing staging or I'm working with the director, um, it's our bodies that matter. You know, when you see someone walk onto the stage, we're reading, we're reading that body in Soria. So it becomes very uh, mindful as well when you decide then what props are going to be on stage. So um, the sad girl who's my dominatrix character in Masikona series, well, she's a Chicana goth dyke vampiric dominatrix. Uh, talk about identities. <laughs> um, and you know, she brings out this, this, um, this whip at some point. It, it's purposeful because there is a history of violence attached to a whip, right? And so there's this character then making a choice to, you know, with permission to create violence and then to also have violence put on herself. So I think that with every performance or every play, you're making decisions about what images are going to be there. And of course the directors come in and interpret it and designers and do things differently. I know that I try to be very aware of anything put on stage is going to inform a performative act. So even a piece of paper that you leave on the side, I'm gonna look at it. All of a sudden if it's on stage, it has a purpose. Si no tiene propósito, take it away, right? And so sometimes what's great about doing something minimal is that you have an opportunity uh, because it's not film where the camera focuses in and comes in on those extreme close-ups. You have an opportunity to ask your audience, look at this, look at this, and then something can begin to carry symbolic weight as the story develops. So for me, the choices are always connected to what's the story about and what are the visual cues to either help move the story along or um, to give you information about the character. Um, same thing with Dreamscape, two chairs, two bodies. Um, as she said, anything, you know, Recurvy <laughs> would always say this, anything, any type of movement, anything on stage has to have a purpose. And to have two chairs and just two individuals on the stage is talking about, you know, someone being shot to death. It, I'm a firm believer that your idea of life shouldn't be an idea that somebody gives to you. It should be your own idea. So to see something, you should create it in your own mind. So to see just those two chairs and to be told the story, again, it becomes more about what the story is versus, like she said, the props. So we had a prop car that was there, and a telephone prop, and you know, I had a prop gun. It becomes more about, oh, well, that telephone prop doesn't look like a real telephone. The car doesn't you start to imagine it in your own mind. And that becomes even more powerful because again, it's, that's your vision of what it is. And again, it's more about the story and the sounds and then taking on this journey about this girl's life versus what you're actually seeing. Yeah, and I think as a writer, I always choose specific, which I learned from my teacher, you choose specific, Karen Cortez, you choose specific objects that identify the character. And that's the only thing you really need to put in your place. You say, oh, my God, you should write novels. Your stage are way too long. Jen didn't mention that I was a bad playwright, but it's okay. But she, um, but she would say, you know, it, if, it's, if it doesn't have to be there, don't, don't put it in. Because what you want to show in your text is exactly the, the important stuff. And the other stuff is all like sort of cream on it. It's like how good your actors are, how good your director is, how great your designers are, what your lighting is. I mean, one of the best productions I ever had was I had this crazy uh, lighting director, I did lighting designer in Greece, who was a heroin addict. It was the most beautiful lighting I've ever seen. It was so hallucinogenic. I was like, it's terrible that he's a heroin addict. He's such an amazing <laughs> lighting designer. And I thought, what happens in people's minds? It's like, and that's really that, that was the that was the stage. It was these lights. It was so beautiful. And, I, and it was in Greek, so I didn't really understand, except that I wrote it because it was my play fur, But it was like. What you know, it was it was revelatory of what you could do with design. So I think you know, I think as a writer and performer, you, you want you want to have your indicative objects, but you really don't need that much more if when 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 the actor is is really present and the text is really present, and the audience is really listening. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Before we leave, I want to send out a virtual shout out and hello to Luis Alfaro who was not able to make this panel today because of flight uh, coming back from
Chicago, but uh, you've been here with us during the conversation in spirit, uh, and I would like to thank our panelists and to thank you as an audience for an incredible conversation, and um, thank you so much. Thank you.